Hi there, it's Sarah Johnstone from Remax Real Estate Kamloops, and welcome to 2022. Woohoo! I can't believe that we are starting in the second year with a pandemic going on still. Um, it's a bit nuts. However, I am crossing my fingers that this year is going to be a better one ahead. 2021 was really good for real estate though. So I am going to take some time in this video here to just sort of summarize what happened with the uh, end of 2021 with where we ended up stats wise, and also to look ahead to this year to see what might happen and some of the things that might influence our real estate market going forward. So let's get started. All right. Don't wait to buy real estate, buy real estate and wait. I've seen this quote attributed to a few people, but certainly any home owner who purchased two plus years ago is reaping the benefits of not waiting and purchasing and seeing how much their property has gone up in value. Here are two examples for you. So I chose both of these homes. They are single family homes in North Kamloops with basement suites. They both have three bedrooms on the main floor and then either a two bedroom or a one bedroom plus den suite. So you can see that 259 Holly Avenue sold in August of 2019 for $460,000 and it resold again this past December for $675,000. So we saw over a $215,000 increase. 717 12th Street, um, I actually was in this home with some clients back in February of 2019 when it sold for just over $450,000. It sold in May for $650,000. So again, we're looking almost at a $200,000 increase. And I should note, I also chose these homes because they haven't been substantially upgraded since they sold in 2019. So basically the increase in price that we're seeing is just pure equity just due to the change in market conditions. So in December, we saw huge jumps in the average single family home price. Um, certainly when you look at that number, we're over the $800,000 mark. There were some higher end properties that did sell in December that pushed that number higher, but it was up over 34%. And the average price year to date for single family homes in the Kamloops and district area, so that includes Merritt, Logan Lake, Chase, Barrier, all those surrounding areas that are part of our real estate board, um, the average price is now over $678 thousand dollars for a single family home. Multifamily also saw some huge increases. So again, the average price for December was up 38% to almost $460,000. And the average price year to date is almost at $400,000. So 20.7% increase over the year prior. All right. So if you are going to sell a house in Kamloops, 25 days is the median time to sell a home. And again, this is the entire region. I would say that many homes within the Kamloops city boundaries are going under contract within three to 14 days. I'm still seeing a lot of um, listings where what they do is they list the property, they allow three to four days of showings, and then on the fourth or the fifth day, they review any and all offers that they receive. And certainly we're still seeing a lot of multiple offers. 83 is the sales to new listing ratio. That's the highest ratio we've seen in 10 plus years, and it's the highest likelihood of selling your home. That's what that ratio means. If you were to put your house on the market right now, the odds are very good that your house is going to sell. Over $2 billion worth of residential real estate was sold in our region in 2021, which is pretty mind-blowing. Those numbers are huge. So the big question, are we still in a seller's market? Heck yes. Yes, we are. <laughs> and you can see here that a lot of this is to do with the low inventory. So on the left there, the active listings, December year to date. So year to date would be from January to December. That's the full year. We had an average of 619 listings per month on the market. And you can certainly see if you go back to 2012, that number was substantially higher. We were at over 2000 listings around that mark from 2012 to 2015. So we've dropped drastically in what's available for buyers right now. And months of inventory for 2021 was two. So what does that mean? That basically means that if no new listings were to hit the market, it would take two months for 
every single listing to sell. And anytime we're at about the four months mark and under, we're in a seller's market. So you can certainly see that since 2017, we've been um, around that. We've been sort of in a seller's market. 2020 got definitely into a seller's market. And 2021, last year, we were in a very hot seller's market. So with that, we've seen the skyrocketing average prices. Why have prices gone up? Put simply, the demand is far outpacing the supply. We've seen record low interest rates. We've seen a need for home offices and more space as people have continued to work from home in this pandemic. Um, there's also been an increase in buyers from out of region. So that's anywhere outside the Kamloops area. We've certainly seen a lot of people from the lower mainland. I've helped clients from Alberta as well. Um, from January to June of 2021, we saw 442 buyers from out of the region. The six months prior to that, we saw 160. So the numbers have substantially gone up. We've also seen a lot of multiple offer situations, which do put, push the price point up because in BC, we have what's essentially called a blind bidding system, right? When you submit an offer and you're competing against other offers, you have no idea what those other offers are under contract for. And therefore, we've seen some pretty staggering jumps in the offer price. And then there's also been the increase of cost of materials for new builds. So um, I think we're going to probably con continue to see some of these issues with the supply chain getting affected by the pandemic. Um, but certainly that added on. I know in Orchard's Walk in Valley View, they had to raise the price substantially, the list price of those new builds out there just to accommodate for the increased cost of building materials. All right, so going forward, what's going to happen this year? Well, the BC Real Estate Association is forecasting a 2.4% increase in the average price for our area this uh, this year. Now, that's potentially going to be higher in certain segments, certainly going back to my earlier examples, single family homes with suites, I expect to see that segment of the market uh, to be very hot. And um, yeah, but that's overall what the average is that they're anticipating. So still an increase, but not quite as high. So what could change the market in 2022? Here is this elusive crystal ball. I get asked this question quite a bit. What's going to happen, right? What's going to happen with the market? How do we time the market? Uh, it is ridiculously hard to do this. Certainly, we even saw that with the pandemic. A lot of people were fearing that the market was going to go down. Um, CMHC was even thinking it was going to plummet down. And it didn't, right? So what are the factors that are going to affect our market? Zombie apocalypse. Well, <laughs> obviously this one is a little bit of a joke. However, with the state of the world right now, I don't know, like maybe it'll happen, right? Um, certainly if it does, I think housing prices would go down, right? Who knows? But on a realistic note, here's some of the things that will actually affect this year's market. So number one, a cooling off period. This has been proposed by the provincial government. Um, they're going to look at legislation this spring. So this is something that has not been enacted yet. Basically, in layman's terms, it's where a buyer can back out of an accepted contract without penalty. Um, we already have this in existence right now for pre-sales with new builds. And those ones, um, buyers get up to seven days after a contract is accepted to get out of the contract for any reason whatsoever. Um, I think it would be really good for buyers who might get swept up in multiple offer situations, certainly in certain markets like the lower mainland, where many buyers have had to go in subject free on an offer in order to be able to compete. Um, this would certainly help them rethink their offer and potentially back out of, um, yeah, back out of their offer if it, if it doesn't feel like it's the right fit for them. I do think it comes with some challenges. Certainly for sellers, it puts their purchases at potential risk. Right. When you're dealing with something like new construction and you're working with a developer and these are projects that are potentially two you know, years away from being completed, the developer isn't using those funds to um, have to purchase something else and trying to balance, you know, sales and purchases at the same time, whether it's someone with their own home, pre-love home. 
you know, they're, they're trying to sell their house, get under contract for a new one. This certainly allows uh, more deals to collapse and it could be really detrimental for sellers. I also think for buyers, it, it could have a bit of a drawback because it makes offers really all about price versus having them be subject free or perhaps some, some subjects removed, which is more common in the Kamloops uh, market here. You know, if you are a cash buyer or let's say you're not, so you don't have financing or you're not going to have a um, home inspection because you feel, you know, you're willing to risk it. You're going to do renos or it's a slightly newer place, whatever the reason. It's going to be difficult now because you're going to have a period of time where you could back out for any reason. So you could still back out for a financing reason or for an inspection sort of type reason, right? Um, so I think it's going to be difficult for sellers to look at some of the clauses being removed um, or subjects, I should say, and, uh, and weight those more heavily. So for some buyers, removing some subjects has been an advantage in the past. So it'd, it'd be interesting to see how that all works out with a cooling off period. The BC government is also looking, number two here, at ending blind bidding. So right now, BC doesn't require sellers to disclose offer details. In fact, they don't actually have to disclose as agents. We don't have to disclose anything. We don't even have to technically tell prospective buyers how many offers we have in hand, whether as other provinces like Ontario have to log um, their multiple offers with their brokerage. So certainly if we were going to have more transparency, if it wasn't such a blind process, we would potentially see a less dramatic increases in price, particularly with multiple offer situations. So a good example of this, and this absolutely does happen, you've got four offers in on a property, Three of the offers are pretty similar. They're all like ten to fifteen thousand dollars above the list price, and then that fourth offer comes in and it's forty thousand, fifty thousand dollars higher than list price. Right? Maybe that buyer they're you know desperate to move. Their house is sold. Maybe they've written on four or five other properties and lost out, and they're willing to go up higher in price. However, they didn't need to go up that high, right? They didn't need to go up by the thirty four the $40,000 difference from the next highest offer. And if we were in a situation where the numbers or the details were actually known to buyers, then we wouldn't see those dramatic increases. One of the ways that this could happen would be something called a referential clause or an escalation clause. Technically, right now, we can already do a referential clause, but the problem is, is that they're not enforced. Um, the way that it would work is that you would put a price, an offer price, into your offer as a buyer. But you'd put a clause in there that would say that you're willing to go up to a certain price by a certain amount over the highest offer. So let's give an example, right? You put a contract in for $500,000 on a home. You put a clause in there, in there that says you're willing to go up to five twenty-five dollars over the next highest offer by $1,000 increments, right? So if the highest offer that the seller received was for five twenty, dollars and you have this clause into your in your contract, then you would be able to get the property at five twenty one. dollars Right now, the seller is under no obligation to show that next um, highest offer that they have. And if you reveal your top price, they could just come back to you and counter and say, hey, we want, we want that price, right? So there'd have to be some legislation in, in that in order to make it um, a process that would work. However, I will say open bidding, it already exists in some countries like Australia, and they have seen their average prices go up by 20% regardless. So I am all for some changes to our process. I find it really frustrating. A lot of my buyers find it very frustrating. Um, I'm in support for some of this, but we'll see if it actually makes a difference to uh, the price points and the average prices going up. All right, number three, mortgage rate increases. If you have been paying attention to the news at all, you have probably heard that this is potentially going to be happening. So they're anticipating fixed rates back at just over 3% by the end of the fourth quarter of this year. Now, RBC is saying that these changes are going to price out some of of the buyer's market, certainly I can see first-time home buyers being hit a bit harder. It's going to cut down their purchasing power and it could help cool the market in particular segments. However, that being said, rates are still low enough. Even 3% is, is quite low, right? It's not record-breaking, but it's a pretty, pretty good deal. And it's not necessarily going to 
decrease demand enough. And even if you look at it in the sense that we're anticipated in Canada to have 400,000 new Canadians this year, right? We're still going to see an influx of people looking for housing. And um, I don't think no one's anticipating that this is going to make a massive change to demand in the market. But Bylaw and tax reform. So this is point number four here. This is where I think it starts to get interesting. So this specifically, I'm going to speak about the city of Kamloops. They are creating more density and developer incentives through their um, zoning, basically. So what they've done is they have changed zoning um, massively. They did a whole rehaul of uh, the zoning in Kamloops back in the fall. And with that came some changes. So certainly some of the things have been reduced parking requirements for multifamily units. So if developers are going to build condos and they're going to put any segment of affordable housing or um, below market rentals, that type of situation, they're going to be able to have less parking spaces. And this is a big deal because a lot of those spaces end up having to be built underground and they get really expensive to do. The city has also created a new RT1C zone and you can see on the map here um, in the image there, this is actually my neighborhood. And this zone allows for small lot intensive duplexes. So what that basically means is under the old zoning, you needed 18 meters of frontage in order to divide a lot into two and to be able to have a duplex, right? And in this case, you're only going to need 15 meters. And that three meters difference is really going to make a difference for some of these properties. Some of them that may not have been able to do this before, you'll be able to take like, you know, one kind of smaller, maybe rundown house and be able to create two properties out of one, which um, would increase the supply on the market. They even have zoning that's considered um, for micro homes. I haven't actually seen this on the map anywhere. You can you can go to the city's map and sort of check out where everything is zoned. So I think this will be something going forward for lot development. Um, and that is going to be only 11 meters of frontage for those lots. So certainly this isn't happening everywhere. This is predominantly in like the downtown Sagebrush area and and in the North Kamloops neighborhoods, um, but it is working to increase density. And the city is also considering expanding their revitalization tax exemption program. This program already exists in the downtown and along the, the uh, Trunk Hill Corridor and the North Shore. And basically it's a tax break, municipal tax break, for developers to redevelop, to take underutilized um, lots or buildings and to turn them into something different. So what they're looking at doing right now is applying that to Columbia Street as well. Uh, the section of Columbia Street where it has a lot of those older motels and hotels could be turned now into multi-housing opportunities. So um, the city would rezone first and then they would offer these incentives to developers. And I do know that I saw at least one hotel owner um, that was quoted in a news article saying that they would take advantage of a program like this if it were put into existence. All right, so new residential development. What am I on here? 0.5, I think. <laughs> so obviously increasing supply. That is honestly in my opinion, going to make the biggest difference into what the market will look like for 2022 and whether or not we'll see massive price increases or, you know, a consistently high, you know, intense seller's market. So the more residential development that can be built, obviously, the more supply we have, which is great. Um, the vice president of the advisory services for the Rennie Group, which is a huge development company in Vancouver, he used housing start data from the Canadian Mortgage Corporation, uh, Housing Corporation, and construction timelines to say that there should be 760 new housing build completions for 2022. Um, certainly, there are going to be some starts within that um, that might be even offered for pre-sale, but people won't be able to move into them until let's say 2023 onward. However, any development at any time, this is this is certainly going to help with the housing crunch. 
any new development needs to keep up, obviously, with the number of people that are moving to Kamloops. So the predictions right now are between 20 to 25,000 new Kamloops area residents by 2041. And I would expect that that number might actually increase if we, you know, continue to see people working from home and we continue to see prices in many of these major urban centers for housing, you know, skyrocket. Um, who knows? We might see a few more residents move here. So what's being developed, right? These are just a few examples I wanted to highlight. So in Juniper West, there is a 45 lot single family lot subdivision that's been approved. The Anova on Tronk Hill, that's what this mock-up image here. If you have been to Bright Eye Brewing before, you may have noticed that there is a large lot on the street across the way. That's this lot. So it has the Kamloops Innovation Center um, on the one side. And then it, uh, it's going to have three buildings that will be built by ARPA Investments. And one of those buildings will have condo units. They will also have a hotel and a text arts center. And I think there's going to be community space too. And I do know that they are hoping to break ground this spring slash summer for that project. Um, the Kelson Group has City Gardens, so that is a 22-story, it actually might be 24-story now. I've taken this from their website, but I do believe they got approval up to 24 stories for a residential tower on uh, Nicholas Street to be completed by 2025. There are more towers going up that will be rentals as well. And then I kind of added this last one on here. I know everyone who's lived in Camelot for a long time, there's been a lot of talk of developing the old sanatorium out near Camelot. Lips Lake on Tronk Hill, uh, past the airport there. There is a developer who owns it. You can go to tronkhill.ca and actually take a look at the plans. They're super neat to look at, um, but the idea would be over 1,500 mixed housing units from condos to cottages built over 15 years, a fully self-sustaining community. Um, it sounds really cool, but we'll have to see if it happens. Now, I do also know, since I sort of even made this slide, that there's a few more things in the works. There is actually going to be some luxury condos being built on Royal Avenue. They are waiting to get approval uh, to rezone on February 1st, um, but that's another ARPA Investments project. And there was just... Um, just recently, I think in the past couple of days, actually, the city approved for a new condo development to be built at Fifth and Victoria as well. So there are lots of different types of developments. And I certainly think a lot of these are geared, not all of them, but a good number are geared towards first time home buyers to help them get into the market. All right, so those are the key things that I would look for. Certainly, I didn't even touch on the fact that the federal government is also proposing um, some ideas going forward to deal with sort of the housing affordability across Canada. So those are things to watch out for as well to see how they will affect our local market. But the long and the short of it is we are still expected to see a seller's market this year. Uh, we're not expecting to see as crazy, you know, double digit, high double digit increases in the average price. But if you're a buyer and you're expecting to wait until the market bottoms out, it's not going to be happening this year. So my advice would be not to wait on that. Um, certainly getting a good realtor like myself, I can help you through the process. I know it is difficult, um, but we can get you a home. And if you're a seller, this is still a really good opportunity to sell. Certainly all of the average prices have gone up as a whole, right? So all the comparables we're looking at are already in those higher, um, uh, new higher average numbers, right? If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. I've got my phone number there. I've got my email. This is a great time of year to plan ahead. And it is a process. It's not something that's necessarily going to happen overnight, either with selling or with buying. So please do get in touch. And I hope to do a few more presentations like this in the future. So if you have any topics that you'd like me to cover, please let me know and I'd be happy to do so. All right, everyone, have a fantastic year ahead and I will talk to you soon.